Good day. Uh, today we're going to learn all about, you know, the beginning of the steam navy and perhaps the most influential man considering the first steam navy is Robert Fulton. And Robert Fulton is an inventor, an engineer, an artist, and actually he was commissioned by the U.S. Congress on 9 March 1814 to build a steam-powered floating battery. Uh, now, so it's a steam battery in essence. And so uh, basically um, he builds a ship called the uh, um, Demo Logos. Uh, and uh, so, you know, we, we take it for granted that steam power is really widespread in the world, but it was not. And we decide to go to it primarily because we are faced in the War of 1812, the threat of invasion. You got to remember that every one of our ports were actually blockaded by the British. They're actually sitting right off of the Craney Island during much of uh, the war from 1813 on. And so how do we defend those harbors? Uh, we can't build enough ships fast enough. Um, and so, um, Basically, uh, they decide to give Fulton a commission uh, to build a, uh, this battery, and which eventually is called Fulton One. And actually, uh, the ship only has one day of service, where it takes President James Madison after the war all around. See, the war ends by the time the ship gets in the water. And so it never is going to be commissioned by the U.S. Navy. Uh, it was a pretty good concept, as we can see here. Um, what's so unusual about the concept is, we're going to talk about it a little later, uh, actually, uh, Captain David Porter will decide that the machinery was worthless. He decides that uh, uh, the ship shouldn't be armed, and so it's going to be taken over to the Brooklyn Navy Yard to serve as a barrack ship. Um, and uh, so it's at there from 1825 until 1829 and then was destroyed um, by a fire, a gunpowder explosion actually on 4 June 1829. Now this uh, of course was the brainchild of the beautiful mind of Robert Filton. Uh, the inquiring mind of Robert Fulton. We start to think about the things he did uh, during his career. Uh, I have to say, it's also so famous for being one great artist. You know, he actually made a living um, creating paintings, landscapes, portraits. Uh, however, in 1786, he develops um, what is called consumption or tuberculosis. And so the doctors say, well, you know, you just need to go to sea and get that sea air and you'll be better. Uh, well, he does that, but by the time he gets over to London, he likes it there and decides to live with Benjamin West. And we know he is one of the great artists, American artists of that age. And so he gets takes lessons from West, and he also produces quite a few uh, paintings himself. In fact, he earned a tremendous income. But he had this mind that kept thinking about how to improve mechanical things. This is the age of canals. So we have to think this is opportunity of using technology to have a viable transportation system that can move goods from place to place. Remember roads back then were terrible, so it is the waterways that we try to take advantage of, and you can do that better by building a canal. You think about the Erie Canal, I don't know how many have been on it, uh, but it actually goes through Lake Anita and, and things like that, Mohawk River, but they improve it enough so when you go down the Erie Canal here in America, you can see where they have the locks and you see a waterfall there. And so we're laddering ourselves up. There are actually 13 locks 
to at near uh, Niagara Falls. And so just trying to reach that different elevation. So he designs some machinery to improve the locks. He actually um, will then uh, actually develop a digger machine so that you can cut the canals rather than do it by shovels. This is a novel experience. And so in England, they were trying to expand their, um, uh, their, their work uh, building canals. Now Fulton uh, then, uh, because he's a kind of a special person, he goes to France and in 1797, now remember England and France are at war with each other during this time called the Napoleonic Wars. Um, we will uh, uh, recognize that he goes there and he offers his services to Napoleon and to build military machines. One of the big things they wanted to have is how can we have a rifle cannon? How can we have a breech loading cannon? Uh, how can we sink all those ships? Uh, and so Fulton, while in France, will actually create a steamboat that operates on the Seine River. But more importantly, uh, he will develop the first practical submarine, the Nautilus, right? And that is basically, it's very similar to David Bushnell's submarine, but uh, still it, it, it very viable. And so uh, uh, he did those things, but then got tired of dealing with uh, Napoleon and uh, the radicalness of his uh, visions for Europe. And so he'll go back to England in 1804, and there um, he will form a partnership with Robert Livingston, um, and he goes back to America, and although the first actually working steamboat was done by John Fitch, but he could not make his ship viable commercially. So what Fulton was able to do is design an engine that was safe. Now I want you, to, want you all just to picture when you're in these steamboats, right, you got some dangers. Number one, there's sparks coming out of uh, the uh, stack. Number two, the boilers, you know, they can blow up. And so this was very risky and people just didn't trust it as much. But uh, uh, good old uh, Fulton will uh, create uh, the Claremont, as we know, is actually first called North River Steamboat, connecting New York City with Albany. So this was a very popular run. And so he uh, uh, basically uh, will um, continue to uh, work on these improvements. So I want to remind you that Fulton's going to die in 1815 at 49 years old from consumption. Now, Fulton knew and promoted and of course, Robert Livingston used to be minister to France. You know, he's a very wealthy person. Actually, he'll marry her, his niece, uh, Harriet. Um, and uh, so he knew that if you have a practical marine engine, steam engine, this would give a tremendous tactical advantage uh, to um, the steamer against the sailing ship. Okay, why does it have an advantage? I can go wherever I want. Uh, I can, um, you know, do things that a sailing ship cannot do. And so they, um, you know, basically, uh, if it's in a calm sea, these early steamboats, they can uh, maneuver, outmaneuver any sail powered ship. Um, actually, Stephen Decatur, James Biddle, and Oliver Hazard Perry promoted this concept as the need for unprecedented warship was obvious. The British had blockaded American ports and had invaded parts of the American coastline. So we don't like that and we have to have some way to strike back. Um, and steamships offered a unique approach. Now his uh, design, as you can see right here, um, is uh, two-deck ship, uh, basically the machinery. It's actually a catamaran. So it has two hulls, right? And the paddle wheel is in between the two hulls. And that is 
something that uh, protected those. He called it a shot-proof ship because he used five inches of oak. And of course, we know that that's not shot-proof, uh, but uh, he wasn't in the ships when they fired. Um, so th they protected the uh, wheel and, uh, and it allowed for more placement of guns. Um, now, we'll get into the guns a little later, uh, but they have 30, um, uh, 32 pounder smooth bores, and they will eventually have, this is the original plan, but eventually they'll have 200 pounder Columbiads. They never made those, but you know, Fulton was thinking, I wanna make my ship be able to fire all the circuits, right? And I don't have to worry about my sails as much. I don't have to really worry about them. And so I have a way to fire in all directions, kind of like the monitor, right? That, that's what made that turret uh, so special. And the steam power allowed it to do exactly that. Now, um, I have to tell you, uh, the Demologus uh, is, uh, could only be a harbor defense ship. It had unreliable engines uh, with a hull that could not take the ship into high seas. So it was a limited use warship, which led to the ship not even being commissioned by the US Navy. So it was laid down on 20 June, 1814. It was launched on 20 October, 1814. The builders were Adam and Noah Brown, very famous clipper ship builders later. Uh, it's called a steam battery, it displaced 1,450 tons. It was 150 feet in length. It was uh, 13 feet draft and 58 foot with a beam, big beam. Now I gotta tell you, this was all run by a one cylinder steam engine that could produce the horsepower of 120 horsepower. Now you think about most uh, lawn mowers today, <laughs> they could do better than that. Uh, so, uh, so it also uh, uh, had, uh, could make 5.5 knots, which when you consider the maneuverability, that's uh, pretty good. And as I said, uh, it had 30, 32 pounder uh, guns and 200 pounder, um, 100 pounder carronade. I mean, uh, Columbia ads. Now I have to tell you, uh, the, uh, as we already said, the Fulton one is going, and it gets renamed that. Of course, Demogos is uh, the voice of the people and the voice of the people against the tyranny of the English. So you have to think about the feelings at the time. Um, so when, it, when the explosion took place and the ship burned, um, we have to come up with a um, something to replace it, but the United States Navy wasn't so enthused about it. Now, um, basically, President Andrew Jackson directed the Board of Naval Commissioners to build a steam battery, and I quote, of a form and size best calculated for the defense of our ports and harbors. They were, when they built this new ship, there were no limitations placed on the budget. And in other words, they had all the money they wanted to spend. And the person that designed the ship was actually Chief Naval Constructor William Humphreys, uh, the same guy that uh, you know, did the Constitution and so forth. So it's amazing how quickly we're going to steam powered vessels. Now, um, he had already designed a steam battery However, it was rejected. Other people also turned in concepts of steam batteries, but they were rejected. Uh, this is, of course, David Porter, who actually decided that the Fulton One was not a viable warship, and that's why it became a barrack ship at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Um, and so the Fulton One or Two is going to be built at the uh, Brooklyn Navy Yard, which you can see in this image. Um, and so um, we have to have, as, uh, as Andrew Jackson wrote, um, we have to have the facility and safety 
from moving from one harbor to another as from New York to Newport or Philadelphia uh, and from the latter place with an ability to move with considerable speed, including sails. So in other words, um, this was a coastal defense ship. However, the U.S. Navy didn't necessarily use it as one because the design of the uh, Fulton II was totally, um, how can I say, unorthodox. Um, and uh, because you have fore and aft firing, you have, uh, and, and, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Now, let me tell you, the guy who pushes this project forward is this man, Matthew Galbraith Perry. And Perry is known as the father of the um, steam navy because he pushes to use this technology as quickly as possible. So he helped supervise with William Humphreys the actual construction of the Fulton II. And so uh, this shows him as a Commodore after Japan. Uh, so uh, uh, anyway, so um, basically the ship will be laid down in 1837 and then it will be launched in 1838. Uh, and when it's launched, I have to say, the press is amazed. One, uh, the Philadelphia Inquirer said, invaluable for harbor defense, uh, went on to say, a rapid, easy boat, boat in smooth water, 14 knots being frequently gotten out of her. Now, this is a major, you know, you think about going 14 knots under steam. Actually, the ship was designed to make 10 knots, but if you put enough steam pressure on, you can increase that, not safely by, by any means, but you could do that. And so that's what, exactly what uh, Perry was trying to achieve. A ship that can go anywhere on the naval battlefield, it needs to, providing a tremendous punch of artillery. Now, the Fulton II all of a sudden becomes considered a tremendous success when it towed the new uh, frigate, wooden sailing frigate, uh, the Macedonian, um, <clears throat> as they wrote, with the ease of a canoe, <laughs> provided that steamers could pull two sailing ships into combat. So in other words, they can take these larger ships like a tug and tow it into a battle. And so that uh, that gives the advantage to the, uh, the American team, so to speak. And so actually it raced the uh, Great Western, which was... Uh, Israel Bunnell's uh, you know, huge ship, 670 some feet in length, and uh, it was powered by paddle wheels. And so they have a race, and guess who wins the race? The Fulton. Now you got to realize that actually the um, Great Western uh, was loaded, ready to go to Liverpool, and so uh, it, it was kind of overburdened with. Uh, freight, but nevertheless, it was a big coup for the American Navy to beat one of the greatest ships produced in England. So they knew that the Fulton was a success, or so they thought. Um, now, uh, basically, this is the Fulton as it is completed. Um, it is... Um, Perry, who sailed on the maiden voyage, um, said that it was very wet in a light seaway. He also complained about the limited range due to the heavy consumption of coal. They could only go 70 knots without recoaling, so they didn't have enough storage space. Um, and so that creates a major problem uh, for the ship. So it really is going to be limited to serving along the coast. However, they put it to other uses, but that's going to be under sail, not under steam. Now, um, the, once the ship went into service uh, in 1839, um, 
it was then decommissioned in 1841 at the Brooklyn Navy Yard and stayed in ordinary until 1851. Well, you can see this is different than the other one because they're going to take it in uh, to um, uh, the uh, Brooklyn Navy Yard and rebuild it, uh, especially its engines. Because you got to see, um, by this time, 1841, Perry is where? In Japan. What does he have with him? The steam frigate, the Mississippi. He has with him the steam frigate Susquehanna. And so those ships kind of scared all the Japanese going, how is this this Navy so powerful? And so, but the ship uh, uh, did not, was supposed to go to Japan, but it did not. Um, it's during its uh, first years, aside from repairs, that's after 1851, it was used as a testing ship. In other words, they test gunnery, how we fire, um, how we work with a steam-powered vessel. Um, but it keep needing various repairs. So in that from 1851 to 1857, it will get repaired at the Washington Navy Yard, the Gosport Navy Yard, the Charleston Navy Yard. Um, and so its job during this period was to range uh, from St. Lawrence, the Gulf of St. Lawrence, all the way down to the Caribbean. Now, uh, and its job was to protect commerce and that sort of thing. It actually participated in the search for the St. Albany. That was a ship that was lost at sea and without a trace. And so um, the Fulton is uh, going to get used in a lot of ways. Uh, now there's the Fulton right there, okay? Uh, so we see she's a smaller ship. I'll give you the statistics in just a moment. But uh, the Fulton, because of its steam power, it's going to participate in Nicaragua in 1857 to round up all of the William Walker's filibusters. William Walker, crazy guy, he tried, thought he could take over Nicaragua and turn it into a, um, an empire with, of course, himself as the uh, leader, uh, the Generalissimo, and that he would allow slavery there, which uh, was a way that the South was trying to expand the slave power um, that you know, was being limited as, uh, by various laws as the nation moved westward. So it picked up uh, involved with that. In 1858, um, it actually um, gained national news when it um, freed five American merchant ships held in Tampico, Mexico. And you can well imagine in comes a steamer and that shocks everyone in Tampico. And so um, he actually joins in operations commanded by uh, Commodore William Shubrick um, with uh, Paraguay. This is the, uh, whoops, this is the Paraguay expedition that um, basically went down to Paraguay uh, to try to improve relations with that new nation. And um, it explores the Plata, the Parana, and the Paraguay rivers, believe it or not. And uh, so it had an advantage operating in rivers because it uh, had steam power. And so um, that gave it a tremendous advantage. This is a precursor of the Water Witch expedition that turned sour for the Americans. Nevertheless, um, it's going to, in May of 1849, uh, be placed at ordinary over at Gosport Navy Yard. And it will stay there from 7 May to 30 July, 1851. Then they recommissioned the vessel and the Fulton cruised off Cuba to suppress the slave trade. And then all of a sudden it was laid up in 1859 in uh, uh, Warrington Navy Yard in Pensacola, Florida. Now, as we know, uh, when uh, the war clouds gather in the United States, on 12 January 1861, uh, Confederate volunteers 
were Southern volunteers, because uh, this is at the very beginning of the Confederacy, and, and they will capture the Warrington Navy Yard, and with it, they have the Fulton II. Now, you all know that there's X problems in the development of the Confederate Navy. One of the biggest ones is, I would say, having marine steam engines. You got to have those engines um, if you're going to operate during a civil war at sea, generally. So uh, the Confederates, however, don't do anything. They don't refit the Fulton. Uh, they don't take the engines out. And uh, so when they abandon the yard on 10 May 1862, uh, the um, Fulton II is going to be burned. Um, so basically, what does this mean uh, to the Civil War? Well, we have to prove the viability of steam-powered warships. And, and the Fulton shows that, although the later ships like the Mississippi, Mississippi, USS Mississippi plays a major role in operations up the Mississippi until it's, you know, um, burned by Confederate gunfire at Port Hudson in March of 1863. But it shows the mobility and it actually plays a big role in the Battle of New Orleans. Actually, its executive officer was George Dewey and he will uh, have the Ram Manassas, which I talked about recently, slide by it and then it sank the, um, the Manassas uh, the creating, as George Dewey said, uh, new portholes for the ship. Um, and uh, uh, so what was the ship all about? Well, I have to tell you uh, that uh, namesake is Robert Fulton. Its builder is Brooklyn Navy Yard. Um, it laid down in 1835, uh, launched in 18 May, 1837, commissioned 13 December, 1831. This is a small ship. Its tonnage was 720 tons. So that's far different than the Fulton One. Now, um, it's supposed to have, um, uh, you know, it was 180 feet in length. It had a beam of 34 feet and a draft of 13 feet. Now, um, they're not reliable descriptions of the engines for the there, there are two different ones. One is found in the D Danish archives, and it talks about a vertical stroke engine, uh, which is different than as-built plans. Uh, so nevertheless, it could make 10 knots. Um, remember, it could only go 70 hours under steam without more coal. So this is the development of coal barges to help this ship stay in operation. It also, because it does not have a condenser, it also has to re-water itself, its water tanks, uh, because uh, although later they'll use salt water in boilers, generally you're not supposed to do that. And uh, remember, boilers are crazy, they blow up. And so it had 130 um, crew members, but it only had four 32-pounder guns. And this is all about testing. That's what uh, Matthew Galbraith Perry was trying to prove with the Fulton II. He didn't expect it to really be a combat ship, but he wanted to prove certain theories about motive power and about how um, this is the future for navies. And he was very successful in doing that. Um, now, I have to tell you, when we go back to the Fulton I, uh, we have to recognize that it was a catamaran-built ship. Now, that very concept was unusual in the United States. Actually, James Eads of St. Louis will take the concept of a catamaran and he'll build a snag boat that was steam-powered. Okay, that worked on the Mississippi to get rid of trees that had come down during storms and so forth. Then the Civil War breaks out, and what does he do? 
he offers to build the city class ironclads, right? And this is uh, the class of ironclads that are going to really make a difference at the beginning of the war, resulting in the capture of Fort Donaldson, Fort Henry, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, basically, the placement of the engine system amidship gives that engine system a certain amount of protection. They also, uh, and, and I have to tell you, city class ironclads were not well armored. They, in fact, um, they had three inches of iron, iron plate. And that won't stop a uh, uh, brook gun and probably many uh, rifled 32 pounders. So uh, it, that concept is used in the building of the city class warships and it's going to really make a difference um, and because uh, the mobility on the waters in the uh, western Tennessee was very very important for the U.S. Navy and its success in 1862. This is the cooperation between the Army and Navy. So in essence Fulton is designing ship concepts for the Civil War 50 years after his death, when we start to think about it. Actually, his death uh, you know, would be at the very end of the Civil War, plus 50 years. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, those were the impacts of Fulton. So we have to think about Fulton and recognize him as such a great inventor. Um, despite everything else he did, uh, his um, warship, the Fulton One, is uh, the ship that um, makes the U.S. Navy recognize what the future warships needed to be. Yet they don't need steam warships that much in the 1850s, do they? They do build several, and they do the uh, eventually with screw propellers for the Hartford class and the Merrimack class, uh, but heretofore they're building paddlers and paddlers are bad for one reason and what is that reason i can take my cannon and one shot into the paddle box and guess what you're out of service or you can go in circles uh, that happened uh, in, off charleston uh, when uh, the mercedia was uh, shelled by the Chicora and the palmetto state and one of her paddles um, didn't work for a while, so she lost steam. But nevertheless, um, uh, uh, this is the future foreseen by Fulton. You know, the lock system used on the Albemarle and Chesapeake Canal is based on a design created by whom? Robert Fulton, believe it or not. So it is, uh, he has a long reach. People just talk about the Claremont, but actually there is far much more that he did, especially for the creation of modern naval warfare. Um, and uh, uh, it's a shame that he didn't live to see uh, his inventions used in such a myriad of ways. Uh, but I have to say, uh, those ships were um, really based on what he had done uh, during the uh, Civil War. So uh, anyway, uh, that is the impact of Fulton 1, Fulton 2. All right. Thanks, everyone. You have a great day. Thank you.